perfect beginning. So next I would like to welcome Richard Lester. Professor Lester is the Japan Steel Industry Professor in the Department of Nuclear Science and Engineering and Vice Provost where he oversees the international activities of the Institute. Professor Lester's research focuses on innovation strategy and management applied most recently to the problem of uh, deep decarbonization of the energy sector. We need to follow up with you more, Richard, on that uh, now that you're done with your big task. Um, he's widely known for his research on nuclear technology, innovation, management, and control. However, this year, he has become widely known as the steward of the development of the soon to be announced um, commitment to grander climate leadership at MIT, which we get to have a preview of um, today. So I'm so pleased that you could join us today. It really means so much that you're here to share this with the staff. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Good morning. And um, thank you, Julie, for the invitation to join you on this special day. And also for the opportunity to thank everyone here for all of the work that you're doing on climate action. Um, I also want to thank Nina. I don't know whether she's still with us. Uh, that's a hard act to follow. Uh, thank you. I really, really appreciate those, those remarks. Um, a little later today, President Kornbluth is going to send a letter out to the MIT community. And in it, she will announce a major new MIT climate initiative building on the fast forward plan that I think uh, many of us here are uh, involved in. And I'd like to just preview for you uh, what um, Sally is going to say. So this new MIT climate project is about how we will work to forestall climate change and also help to shape it, manage it, and live with it because there will be no end to the impacts of climate change within our lifetimes or those of our children and grandchildren. So why now and why MIT? The answer to why now is pretty straightforward. And some of you may recall that last year in her inaugural message, Sally challenged the MIT community to mount what she referred to as a bold, tenacious response to the greatest scientific and societal challenge of this or any age. Now, certainly that's not to say that our community has been missing in action. Uh, for example, in addition to the efforts that Julie uh, mentioned, almost a third of our faculty have been working on different aspects of this problem. We're spinning out new companies in climate tech. We're helping in many other ways. But Sally challenged us. We need to do more, much more, she said. And this is also what many of us in uh, this community believe too. Uh, as one longtime faculty member said, I don't think I've ever felt a stronger gravitational force at MIT than the one around climate. The answer to the second question, why MIT, is that unusually and perhaps uniquely among American research universities, MIT can mobilize all of our disciplines around a mission-driven, solution-focused, global approach to the climate challenge. So please remember those key words. All MIT, mission-driven, solution-focused, and global. And since last summer, my small team, and I, there are a number of key uh, members of the team here. I see Beth Dupuy and Marco Munoz there and Tom Kiley there. Uh, uh, these people have been absolutely uh, core to this, uh, this effort. And we've been working with many colleagues across the Institute to try to convert President Kornbluth's vision into a concrete plan. 
And we asked ourselves, as I think many people here also ask themselves, how can MIT do bigger things faster in the climate domain? And how can we work more effectively with our partners to implement and scale practical solutions, both locally and globally? And I'm going to talk very briefly about some of the answers that we've developed, starting with the goal. When we asked the MIT faculty, uh, many, many of them, more than 100 of them, um, what were their hopes and aspirations for MIT in this area, the answer that landed best was that MIT's climate work should have changed the expected trajectory of global climate outcomes for the better within 10 years. That's an ambitious goal. It's an optimistic goal. And it says that we at MIT should be judged by our impact on the world, which is what MIT really is about. And to achieve that goal, we'll need to become, within the next decade, one of the world's most prolific and collaborative sources of science-based technological, behavioral, and policy solutions for the global climate challenge. Some people might say, well, we're already that. I'm not sure that we're already that, but it is a reasonable aspiration for us. And how will we do it? Well, the approach we're recommending has three main components that we're calling the climate missions, the frontier projects, and climate HQ. The missions are university-wide problem-solving communities, each focused on a clear and broad mission, each reaching across the institute and also outside for its membership, and each charged with road mapping and assessing progress towards its mission, with identifying critical gaps and bottlenecks, constraining that mission, and with launching and supporting projects to overcome those bottlenecks where the MIT community and its partners are well positioned to achieve impactful results. The projects launched by these missions will range in scale from a single investigator working with one or two graduate students to larger scale projects, including big bets on potentially game-changing developments. These are what we're calling the frontier projects, intensive fixed-term projects attacking MIT hard problems with specific goals, milestones, and deliverables. They will demand operational as well as scientific excellence, and they will be professionally led and managed. The third component we're calling Climate HQ which will support fundamental research in the core scientific and humanistic disciplines related to climate, as well as the climate-related education efforts led by our departments and schools. Climate HQ will also support MIT's contributions to public education on the climate issue and to online education for people around the world who want to play a role in seeking solutions to the climate challenge. And there's much great work already going on in those areas. Climate HQ will organize a global competition for researchers around the world working in fields related to the MIT climate missions. And it will support an MIT-wide student-centric climate core to elevate climate-related community-focused service in the MIT culture. So let me say a few words, uh, a few more words about the six initial missions. Of course, it begins with decarbonization, where more than 150 of MIT faculty are already working to develop new solutions. Many of these focus on clean electricity and clean fuels, advances in zero carbon options like solar and wind and nuclear, uh, including nuclear fusion and new developments in long duration grid storage, but also innovations that radically reduce the demand for polluting energy in the huge industries 
that drive such a large share of emissions around the world, cement, steel, chemicals, textiles, and so on. And also, increasingly, computation, where AI and other new applications are accounting for a rapidly growing share of global emissions. How can these industries be reconfigured quickly and reliably and cost-effectively from new chip architectures, semiconductor architectures, to energy-efficient algorithms, to all-electric industrial process flow sheets? This is the tough tech mission for clean industries, understanding technical problems at a fundamental level, developing practical, workable solutions and helping to scale them. And it's a sweet spot for MIT. The second mission is about turning the clock back on greenhouse gas emissions and accumulation in the atmosphere. And we're exploring both large-scale engineered systems and nature-based solutions to do this. this. These are enormously expensive today. But unless we develop cost-effective new approaches here, the, the prospect for re reaching net zero may be out of reach. For example, can we find ways to accelerate the pace at which the oceans are pulling carbon out of the atmosphere without serious collateral damage to oceanic life? And then many of our faculty and students and, and many of us here in this room, I think, are motivated by what's been called the triple climate inequality, the fact that the worst effects are being suffered by the poorest communities who have the least responsibility for the underlying causes and also the fewest resources to protect themselves. So the third mission is about developing new technologies, new policies, and new sources of finance that can help and empower these communities. If your goal is to reduce emissions, you should probably focus on the US and Europe and one or two other big rich countries and even more important, China and the other middle income countries of South and East Asia where more than half the world's population lives. But if you want to limit the consequences, the adverse consequences of climate change, the biggest impact that you can have uh, is in the poor and energy poor countries of the global south. And MIT faculty and students are focusing on technologies for clean water, climate resilient crops. Others are focused on remediating the adverse health effects that may well be the most serious consequences of climate change. And where, for example, JPAL, the Poverty Action Lab, has redirected part of its international network for addressing education and poverty and other social uh, policies to assessing the impact of policies for climate mitigation and adaptation. The fourth mission focuses on cities, which dominate the global economy. They account for three quarters of greenhouse gas emissions, and which in some cases are becoming unlivable in the face of climate-related disruptions and where our architecture and urban studies and planning departments are actually the pace setters in the MIT academic community when it comes to the intensity of faculty and student engagement on climate uh, solutions. Policy issues obviously infuse all of these platforms, but we're also planning a self-standing policy mission to highlight MIT's distinctive voice at the intersection of technology and policy and the tools and the methodologies and the data platforms that we develop here for decision makers. And then finally, the wild card mission to support out of the box thinking that won't find a place in any of these other missions and to provide space for the people who can see around corners. That's a core strength of the uh, MIT community. So these six missions and the projects they'll launch will signal 
we hope clearly to our friends and our partners and supporters that this is where MIT sees important opportunities to make progress on the climate challenge that we are building university-wide problem-solving communities to amplify our impact around these, and that this is where we'll be undertaking more big bets, like the work in fusion, like j Powell's work in uh, energy-poor communities, like the MIT methane network led by uh, Professor Desiree Platter, 26 researchers spreading right across the institute, focused on the potential to avoid critical climate tipping points by removing methane from the atmosphere as quickly as possible. And I just briefly want to mention two other components of this new climate project. The first is to strengthen what we're calling, not originally, the climate scaffolding. The people, especially the people, but also the processes who connect our research and education on campus to the practical world of climate impact and response. That includes uh, existing units like the Deshpande Center, the Martin Trust Center, the Technology Licensing Office, and also the innovation ecosystem around us, including the Engine and Lab Central uh, and, and, and Greentown Labs, and the very real possibility of helping this region become one of the world's great centers for climate and energy related innovation. What we're also planning here is the development of a new cohort of dedicated climate impact professionals at MIT itself. Not faculty, not postdocs, but project managers, matchmakers, accelerators, diplomats, mentors, and people we bring here, resident fellows armed with practical, timely information about real world experience and pain points to help us broaden our horizons and expand our ambitions. And we need to be sure that we have an environment at MIT in which these professionals can thrive and do their best work. And then finally, there is our global strategy for climate. Now, look, there's a lot more to be said about all of this. Um, when you see President Kornbluth's announcement today, you can read more uh, about it. Also, I should say the clay is still wet here. This will continue to take shape as more excellent people at MIT step forward uh, and become uh, involved in all of this. But let me just finish here with, with one with one point. We know here at MIT from our own history that new ways of thinking and seeing and doing can achieve things that might once have seemed impossible. That's what we do here at MIT. And that's what we must do here at MIT on climate. We're just one institution, a relatively small one, but our community, I think including many of the people in this room, believes that we have an important role. And this plan is about helping bridge the gap between what we would accomplish as a collection of energetic, talented, ambitious individuals and what we're capable of if we act together. So let's get to work. Thank you.